My topic is learning from signals. And uh, before we move to that topic, I would like to ask a question. Where are we heading? That's because uh, in our everyday lives, we see more and more smart devices. Uh, these devices are uh, equipped with sensors and data transmission rates are higher than ever before. So I think uh, one answer is that we are going towards uh, information society and more and more networked world. And I would say that my field, so signal processing, is a technology that drives this information revolution. And the topic, so learning from signals, is in the heart of this uh, information revolution. Because we need to, we have massive pools of data and we need to learn from that. We need to make that data into value. So Jorma was briefly mentioning my career path and uh, gonna mention it again. Uh, so I was first a quite theoretical guy because I mas got my master's in mathematics. Then I realized that I want to do something more applied and uh, I moved to statistics and got my PhD on that field. Then I made another uh, change in the field when I got a position as a postdoctoral fellow at signal processing. And uh, in fact, then I realized that I like this field a lot because I got my second doctoral degree in, in this topic. And later, I, I can say now that this very nonlinear career path was actually a blessing because I got to realize that if you take those three fields and look at the intersection of those fields, then at that uh, intersection is actually a signal processing. So without that twist and the fact that I was a guy who didn't know what to study, uh, I'm here in front of you today. So let's talk about signal processing. So first of all, what are signals? This is something that if I say that I work in signal processing, many people ask that. So signals are basically data, but the data is usually acquired by sensors. And sensors are basically tiny devices that measure that physical variable that we are interested in. So for example, if you have a smartwatch, then that watch measures many things, your heart rate, it measures how well you sleep. In fact, the watch knows you better than you know yourself. So it, it has a lot of information. It captures a lot of data. And so basically we have sensors that gather data and um, we need to transform that data into knowledge. And that is uh, basically my field and that's what our research group is doing. So that was one explanation what I do, but another one is what I usually tell is that I'm a manager of a, a general store. But we don't provide usual tools, we provide tools for data science. So for example, if you are, a, let's say, an engineer working in a company that makes virtual reality classes, then you usually knock on the door and ask that, uh, what is the best image denoising algorithm? Okay, so we try to help. If you work in a hedge fund, then you may want to knock on our door and say, give me best algorithm to predict the stock prices. No problem. So my kids often ask, not often, but sometimes the difficult question that, what do you do, daddy? And actually, they are here. So this is a typical day in the life of a signal analyst. We do gather the data from the sensors. We process it. And at the end of the day, we want to understand what we learned and make value of that information. But in between, 
we do modeling and we do estimation. Oh, I forgot something. We are academics. So I think what is common to my tenured fellow professors is that, and my family also knows that, that we do burn the midnight oil quite a bit. So we write the papers, grant proposals, etc., uh, etc. Et so what is, so I said that we have these four phases in our research. I think the first phase, if I describe what we do, is, is processing. And maybe uh, one has to first take a look at your data. So for, as, for example, if we have gene expression profiles, so we would have gene expression profiles from different samples, we would represent it as a matrix. But if we have social media data, then we would have graphs. And that's because every data point may be linked to another. So for example, Esa is connected to Mikko, Mikko to Yukka, Yukka may be connected to Tarja, but Tarja is not connected to Esa, and so on. Sometimes we may have sequence of matrices. So for example, if we have speed signals from several people, we may represent it in, in time frequency domain. But since we have several signals, we may write it as a tensor because that provides a better representation so that we can learn from that. And so these are the kind of subfields of signal processing that my research group are actively working. So genomic signal processing, tensor data analysis, and graph signal processing. So uh, let's go to the second phase, so modeling. This, I would say that when we model the signals, I would say the important thing is to remember that models are imperfect. So, but some of them are useful. So let's just say that a good model is a simple one, but it should give a good fit to the data. So this is an example from our research where we had real-world clutter measurements. And we built up a statistical model for it, and we obtained a very, I would say, nearly perfect fit for the data. And now this model is used uh, by radar specialists in the world. So that was a good day for a signal analyst to, to come up with this. So it's not a very typical day, but that was a nice day. So we are still in the modeling phase, and then we have to remember that sensors are not perfect, so they have uh, they can be malfunctioning, so we get outliers. And robust data science is, is a field that tries to cope with these outliers. So outlier is an observation that deviates from the fit that is suggested by the majority of the observations. And this work in the group accumulated in 2018 when our book was published by Cambridge University Press. And since there are some people here working in data analysis, I would like to advertise that we have software toolbox in three languages. So in Python, MATLAB, and R. So you can start to become a robust data scientist today. So. And what I like also about robust data science is the fact that uh, it, it's a very nice tool for uh, modeling this kind of impulsive or spiky random processes. So I, I give you one example. So take a stock prices. So here is an example of uh, net returns of a NASDAQ 100 index. And maybe you see some spikes there. Sometimes you make big losses and sometimes you make big wins. And when you try to model that with a usual distributions like Gaussian distribution, you can see that you are actually making a very poor fit. And why does these spikes appear? It's because investors react to news. And that's why you have all the time these things. So take a, one simple tweet, and you may have either a big win or a big lose. 
So that's why you need robust data science in order to cope with this. So now we are after lunch, we do estimation. And what is estimation? That is some uh, question that uh, uh, is good point. So we have built earlier a model. And now we would like to build a mathematical criterion so that we can uh, find an estimate of the value of the parameter of that model. And of course, we would also like to find a very efficient algorithm for that. And here's an example where it's good to have knowledge of math and statistics, because this really builds on mathematics. So for example, in this example, we had parameter that was lying on a manifold. So therefore, we use differential geometry and optimization on a manifold to say, it's uh, to answer the questions like, does this criterion have a unique minimum or how to find that minimum? So now the interesting questions, what do we learn and what do we do? So we are now at learning phase. So if our sensors are cameras, then we may get sequence of image frames. Then our task is to say, for example, where is there a pedestrian? So very important question. So sometimes a uh, sensor is an uh, accelerometer in a cell phone. And we get data and the task is that to find out what is the activity one is doing at that moment. So there are examples. Well, sometimes the learning task that signal analyst does is something different. We want to understand brain dynamics. So how is, so in this example, we had fMRI scans and the, and the task was to learn uh, which part of the brains are activated during the certain, when uh, the person is doing certain uh, 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 task. So this was, uh, research that was done in collaboration with radiologists from Oulu University Hospital. So this, with these examples, I like to uh, illustrate the diversity of signal processing and what signal analysts do. So now, uh, finally, at last, I would like to uh, convey my thanks. So first of all, to my research group and alumni who are actually responsible for all these nice results. And during this uh, uh, nonlinear career path, I, I say that I have had really a pleasure to work with many uh, brilliant scientists from abroad. And uh, I would like to also thank my academic father, so of my first and second PhD degree, and uh, of course, all the funding sources that has made this career path possible, especially the Academy of Finland. So thank you. <laughs>